Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Maximize Spring Fundraising and Maintain Donors Through 2020. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items so all callers will be muted. If you lose your Internet connection, you can reconnect using the link that was emailed to you. We'll also be posting the webinar on our website at techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars if you have to leave early or if you want to watch the webinar again. We'll also be sending an email with the presentation, the recording, and any relevant links that we talk about today. If you're on social media, feel free to send us a tweet at TechSoup using hashtag TSWebinars. Um, but like I said earlier, we'll be using the chat box that you see on the left-hand side to, to take questions today. So just a little bit about TechSoup before we get started. We are located in 236 countries and territories. We serve, <clears throat> we serve over a million nonprofits. And we partner with uh, several technology companies like Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec, and several others that you see here to make our mission possible, offering uh, donated or discounted technology. If you're interested in seeing if your nonprofit is eligible to receive um, discounted, discounted or donated technology, you can use the URL below. And I'll, I'll chat it out here in a second um, if you guys want to see if you're eligible. All right, so I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. So if you don't mind uh, just chatting in the chat box where you're calling in from, and I'm going to read a few of them out just so I can make sure that you guys can hear me okay. All right, we have New York, South Carolina, Washington, Michigan, Austin, Texas, Bloomington, Indiana. That's where I went to college. Um, great, okay, perfect. So it seems like you guys can hear me okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's speaker. So my name is Seema Tucker, and I'm the Senior Manager of Content here at TechSoup. And with me on the call today I have Molly Trerotola. And Molly's background in philanthropy ranges from managing small-scale fundraising campaigns for nonprofits to large-scale communication projects for a Fortune 500 company's philanthropic initiatives. At Give Lively, Molly coordinates the startup's presence at events and in the media and she works with nonprofits of all sizes to tell stories about their experience with fundraising technology to support their mission. We also have Andrea McDonald, who is the Senior Account Executive at Give Lively. And Andrea works with hundreds of nonprofit members to capitalize on online fundraising. Prior to joining Give Lively, Andrea spent 10 years in nonprofit development. She most recently managed the Donor Advised Funds Program at Brooklyn Community Foundation. She also supported annual fundraising for Phoenix Charter Academy Network in Boston, serving as the Manager of Development. Andrea received her MA um, in Campaign Management from Fordham University. So I am going to go ahead and pass it off to Molly. Thank you so much, Seema. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is Give Lively's second TechSoup webinar. We did one last year around developing a strong end-of-year campaign, so we're really excited to shift gears into spring fundraising. Before we jump in, just want to reintroduce ourselves and dive into Give Lively a bit. So Seema did a great job of introducing us, but Hello, I'm Molly. I'm the Media and Communications Manager at Give Lively. I've been with Give Lively for a year and a half, and I have um, a lot of experience working with nonprofits, developing communications campaigns, and the rest Seema covered really well. Hi, everyone. This is Andrea McDonald. I am a Senior Account Executive here at Give Lively. I work with over uh, 200 nonprofits currently and support them on their online fundraising goals and technology implementation. As Seema mentioned, I previously worked in nonprofit development, supporting both community facing organizations and national nonprofits. So, a little bit about Give Lively. Before we dive in, we want to provide background on what we're all about um, and who's behind the webinar. Give Lively is a startup based in New York, and we build better online fundraising technology and give it away to nonprofits for free. Our operation is fully funded by two philanthropists, and because of their generosity, we don't charge for the technology that we build and provide to nonprofits. Some of our driving values behind this mission are developing exceptional technology as a force for social good, working experimentally and collaboratively with our nonprofit members to drive rapid and sustainable change, and through our work, 
our impact is that nonprofits get to keep more of their funds to put towards their missions, and nonprofits large and small have access to the best fundraising technology, and we're constantly evolving it to fit nonprofits' needs. And then donors also get the ease and simplicity they've come to expect elsewhere with other technology experiences. Great, and I'm going to talk about our actual platform. Give Lively is currently partnering with over 3,000 nonprofits across all 50 states. The great thing about Give Lively's technology is that our platform offers the ability to utilize components of the tech a la carte, or you can um, choose to implement the platform as a whole, depending on your nonprofit's online fundraising needs. We offer customizable technology, including everything from unlimited campaign pages, embeddable widgets, text to donate, event ticketing, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and so much more. All of these features can be utilized to maximize your fu spring fundraising efforts, which we'll be talking about today. All right, so let's dig in. That's what you came here for. Whether or not you have a spring campaign planned, we hope the next several minutes, near to an hour, provides insight into the following. Um, spring fundraising strategies for a successful campaign push, how to nurture donors, existing donors, and bring in new donors in the process, and then keeping those donors invested throughout the year to re-engage at year end. Spring fundraising can be difficult, so you want to get creative and try new things, not only to re-engage donors who gave at the end of the year, maybe, but also to cultivate new relationships, um, and then learning what works and wasn't, doesn't work through experimentation. Okay, so why this webinar now? What's spring all about? Uh, and what's the big deal with planning a, a campaign that focuses on donor retention now? Spring is traditionally nonprofit gala season, and it's a great time for events. People want to get outside and be face-to-face -face because of the beautiful weather. It's also a great opportunity to re-engage first-time donors from last year, perhaps individuals who donated to your campaign um, around Giving Tuesday or your end of your push. Um, and it's also a super time to set the groundwork for building strong donor relationships that you can leverage again in the fall. Beginning of the year is a good time to capitalize on because people are turning over a new leaf, creating New Year's resolutions, making pledges, setting intentions for the year to come, and they're receptive to learning about new causes and getting involved. And then when the year end approaches in the fall, people will give to charities that they've already established relationships with. And then finally, donor retention um, is one of the biggest challenges facing nonprofits. Bringing in new donors is costly, so it's worth investing time in existing donors who have already demonstrated interest in your organization. Um, a study by the Association of Fundraising Professionals said that 60 to 70% of new donors fail to give to the same organization again the following year. And then also, um, a Research by the Rockefeller Corporation indicated that over half of donors leave an organization, who leave an organization, they do so because of lack of effective communication from the nonprofit they supported. So these two things together mean that there's drop off from first time donors and the key is keeping them engaged through active communication um, because these relationships will, will eventually pay off. Great. So over the course of our presentation, we're going to walk you through a spring fundraising roadmap from developing goals, identifying an inspired campaign theme and why that's important, effective fundraising mechanisms and best practices to follow so you can reach all of your spring fundraising campaign goals. We'll also view the donor's journey through the roadmap with an example donor persona that will carry through the remainder of the presentation. So the first thing that you're oops, sorry. <laughs> so the first thing that you're gonna to want to do is set an intention and goal for your campaign. Clearly establish what you are trying to accomplish and how you're going to get there. Next, you're gonna be developing a relevant theme for your spring fundraising campaign. Then we'll talk about planning your fundraising strategies and understanding exactly how you're going to go about raising money. And then we'll show you an example execution of these steps together. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is setting your nonprofit's goal. You're gonna think about different goals that you can target with your spring fundraising campaign. It can be monetary, it can be something like increasing your donor base with new donors, focusing on gaining millennial donors, or increasing monthly sustainers. 
Whatever you'd like to focus on, make sure you have a clear and measurable goal so that you can, after your campaign, reflect back on your success. The goal we will focus on in this webinar will be utilizing new fundraising tools to engage new donors that can be stewarded throughout the year, teeing them up for an end of year ask. Now we're going to dive into developing a theme for your campaign. A campaign theme is important because it provides a rallying point and relevance for your donors. It is the anchor and will help to generate buzz and a sense of urgency. Rally supporters around current events, awareness days, holidays, birthdays, and anything else creative that you can think of. You should definitely uh, consider having a lot of fun, fun with your theme and doing something original and out of the box. So you can focus on a spring holiday. Here at Give Lively, we've seen a lot of our nonprofit members develop strong campaigns focused on holidays like Mother's Day, Father's Day, International Women's Day, and Earth Day, to just name a few. You could also consider any organizational-wide milestones, like your organization's anniversary or maybe the birthday of a key stakeholder, such as your founder. You also have an opportunity to catalyze on current events that have a specific tie-in with your nonprofit's mission. For example, if you're an environmental organization, consider focusing on natural disaster relief that's timely and present. If you're focused on social justice reform, consider a rallying call around current political events. These types of themes are powerful because they activate your engaged donors, often have a connection to some kind of viral social media campaign, and that will allow your organization to capitalize on them. You also can always create a program-specific digital campaign. You can tailor a spring campaign to be focused around a specific program component of your organization. For the sake of our webinar, our example campaign will be focused around fundraising for girls.org with a theme based on International Women's Day, which this year falls on March 8th. Next, we're going to plan out our campaign now that we have a goal and a campaign theme. We have to figure out how we're actually going to fundraise donations. It's time to develop that game plan. In the next few slides, we'll go over common and innovative fundraising strategies that will leverage existing donors to cultivate new relationships. I want to preface this by saying we're going to make a lot of suggestions over the next few slides. You don't need to use all of them, but we want to share all of the options. Please think about getting innovative, creative, and having fun with your spring campaigns as we review the next few slides. So the first option is hosting an event. It's a great way to bring existing donors and new prospects together. Events allow the rare opportunity to get face time with your supporters. There are different types of events you can host to engage, a different, to engage different groups. Consider an active event like a walkathon or bike ride. These are great opportunities to use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising to raise dollars for your campaign. Host a social event like your annual gala, a concert, or task your junior board with hosting a happy hour. Events like these generate donations through ticket sales. You can also incorporate innovative technology at your event in the room by using things like text to donate. Consider throwing a supporter appreciation event. Maybe you have a group of new donors who gave at 2018 year-end that you haven't met yet. This is a great way to get them in a room face-to-face -face, and give them a huge thank you without making an ask. Again, another great idea with your event is fundraising within the room. This is a new innovative technology that you can use and incorporate in your live fundraising event. Text to donate is a great option for a live event. It allows you to ask, make an ask of donors in the room, and it eliminates the work of your development team for having to go back after and follow up with pledge cards uh, for people who pledged in the room. When they're text, using text to donate, they have the opportunity to complete their donation in real time, which allows you to follow up with a genuine thank you and continue stewarding the relationship in a heartfelt and intentional way. Peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is the next thing we're going to go over. This is a great way to empower your ambassadors and stakeholders to fundraise in a new and unique way with minimal time from your internal development team. It's an easy way to keep existing donors engaged 
while leveraging their networks to expand your donor base. Remind them that it's easy to create a peer-to-peer -peer campaign for things like their own birthdays, anniversaries, or other special life events that are going on and are relatable. You can target different groups of existing donors. For example, if you're working to engage more millennials, peer-to-peer -peer is a great way of getting their support and investment in your organization. You also have the opportunity to engage donors in some friendly competition by doing peer-to-peer -peer challenges and utilizing technology like peer-to-peer -peer leaderboards to show donors how they're stacking up against each other. Next, we're going to execute on our campaign. We spent time planning, our goals are clear, we've identified our strategies, and now it's time to move ahead with spring fundraising. Okay, that was a lot of information. So let's take a moment to recap the key takeaways. First, you're going to want to set a goal, a clear and measurable goal for your spring campaign. Then you're going to have some fun and create a unique and fun theme that relates to your organization to fundraise around for the spring. And then you're going to go ahead and plan the fundraising strategies you'll use to raise dollars to reach your spring fundraising goal. Now we're going to bring you along a donor journey from attraction to your mission to donor conversion. Again, we'll use peer-to-peer, -peer, excuse me, again, we'll be using fundraising for girls.org focused on International Women's Day. And we're going to use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Thank you so much, er Andrea. Hi, everyone. It's Molly again. I'm going to bring you through an example donor journey. Um, showing you the phases that lead to a donation and what you can do to ensure success along the way. So this is our example persona, Natalie Newby, and this is what you need to know about her. She's never donated to girls.org, but she is friends with a volunteer, Simone, who you saw in the previous peer-to-peer -peer slide. Natalie's qualities are that she's active on social media, she's engaged in current events, and also invested in her local community. All right, so remember that we've set our example nonprofit goal. We want Natalie or someone like Natalie to donate during the spring campaign, and then we want to keep her invested so that she'll donate again in the fall. And we'll do this through peer-to-peer, -peer, as Andrea said, um, that we've established for our spring campaign push. All right, so first up is the attraction phase. What will actually lead our example donor, Natalie, to be introduced to girls.org through Simone and then later become a donor? Girls.org asked Simone to support their spring campaign around International Women's Day um, to help fundraise for their programs. And Natalie sees Simone's uh, a tweet leading to her peer-to-peer -peer page that she, once she's like perusing topics online related to International Women's Day, uh, maybe they're trending on social media, but she's intrigued. But let's break it down. What actually led to that point? Um, in the next slide, we'll talk about some, some tips and tools. So to ensure donor attraction, you have to set up your fundraisers for success. How are we going to set up Simone for success? Um, maybe we gave her a communications toolkit with template emails that she can send to her network, draft social media posts, examples of past uh, successful campaigns, if available, but the tools to be successful in external communications. We also want to provide some type of marker system so our peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers can track their progress along the way. At, at you know, two-week mark, they should have raised this much. At, at this other mark, 90% of the goal. Otherwise, um, they might not know how they're tracking against their overall goal. And then also suggest a target goal so they know how much they're supposed to be fundraising. Are you hoping a fundraiser or are, is girls.org hoping that a fundraiser raises $50 or $5,000? And in what time frame? By providing a recommended target, we can help track accurately against our overall campaign goal. And then finally, checking in, supporting our donors along the way, just letting fundraisers know that you're there for them is super helpful and that you're in, um, you're invested in their progress and their success in a campaign. Okay, so the next phase of Natalie's donor journey is engage. 
The engagement phase is that Natalie saw Simone's tweet, arrives at the fundraising page, great. But this is another opportunity, um, or this is another part of the donor journey that creates friction and um, that a donor might fall off and not continue their journey. So what can we do to ensure engagement in the mission and then keep her moving forward along the donor journey? Um, some strategies to do this through messaging and technology, evoking emotion with the right messaging and imagery, which we're gonna dive into. So tips for messaging for impact. Um, here are some strategies to ensure Natalie stays on a donation page and becomes invested in the campaign and the mission. First, you need to optimize your messaging by being consistent and cohesive and strive for an appealing online presence. This means language, branding, imagery that's consistent across channels, and also messaging that focuses on constituent success stories and doesn't rely heavily on number metrics because individual stories are really what um, evokes emotion and creates impact. You should um, strive to include powerful imagery through pictures and videos. And if you don't have these in your nonprofit's archives, you can always look to free websites um, like Flickr, Creative Commons, or Unsplash that have great stock photo imagery to use that would better um, or can help illustrate your organization's mission. And then also in your messaging, have a clear call to action. What do you want the donor to do? Donate one time, become a monthly donor, support X program, be clear about the call to action and the intended outcome. And then also what you hope to accomplish through impact stories. Show the impact of a dollar amount so that a donor knows that $50 may do this, $100 may do this, or higher donation amounts, but illustrating the impact of, um, of a dollar is really important. And then finally, build a sense of urgency in your campaign with the deadline and fundraising goals. And all of these elements together establish trust with the donor um, and that a potential donation can make a real impact. Moving along the donor's journey is the conversion phase. This is the long haul. Natalie is fully engaged and about to donate, but your work is not done yet, and this is arguably the most important phase of a donor's journey. In fact, over half of donors who start a donation process don't finish it, and this is called donor drop-off or donor page abandonment um, because this can be a main point of friction if it's not easy as, as easy as possible for a donor to give. As I said, there are several friction points along the donation process and the um, actual checkout. Is, so we're going to dive into the technology piece right here. Um, the actual checkout process is one of those main points. You want it to be as seamless and enjoyable as possible by providing the right technology. Try not to create barriers for your donors to finalize their donations. You can do this by keeping your checkout form concise and collecting only the donor data you absolutely need in the moment. Um, we've shown that asking additional questions and having this long-winded form, actually it deters donors from finalizing the donation process, whereas a form that has a single-click or, or a double-click checkout process is much simpler. Also, don't make, don't make your donors search for your donation page or donate button. Um, put your fundraising button front and center of your website if that's where you choose to have it. Um, just make it easy for them to donate. And then for, again, with the technology piece, ensure ease of use for the donor. And you can um, do this by making your donation pages or website mobile optimized. This is especially important for attracting younger donors because younger donors are always on their phones or on the go. Um, so if a donation page is not optimized for a mobile device and that's where they're reaching it the first time, then they might not donate in the moment and might not remember to do so later on. And then finally, and I know this is a long slide, but offering multiple payment method, methods also makes it easy for donors and removes any potential barriers. This doesn't mean having a million different ways to donate on your website like Amazon Smile and multiple um, donation platforms, but it means different payment methods like um, your donation for an offering debit, credit, ACH, et cetera. Okay, so step two of, of this phase, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. So after ensuring donor conversion, amazing, Natalie donated to 
girls.org's uh, International Women's Day campaign. But now that we've cultivated this new donor and hopefully a new donor pool through the spring fundraising push, how can we ensure that they don't fall off or forget about the organization during a summer lull? We're going to show you how to do so through various messaging strategies, starting with best practices and then tangible examples using Natalie's donor persona and donor journey. Um, we're going to leave behind hard fundraising strategies right now and focus on um, communications and messaging, but we'll loop back into that later. And I actually see a comment from Alexandria right now about, about donor burnout, and we'll talk about that in this slide. So thank you so much for your comment. Okay, so best practices for this phase of the donor journey, which is the retention phase and making sure a donor is invested. Number one is don't neglect existing donors. You can do this by making sure to send a thank you within 24 hours of each donation. And there's no exception to this. It's just like purchasing something online. You want a confirmation that your purchase has come through. Same thing for donations. A thank you to a donor, letting them know that you know, you're acknowledging the donation. Um, a lot of platforms do this for you automatically. Um, and if your platform does not do it for you automatically, try to set something up within your organization to send um, an automatic email or just a thank you. And then stay connected throughout the year with multiple touch points like sharing updates and stories about your, organization, your organization's impact. And we'll go more into that in the next points. Um, but just ensuring that they stay connected to your cause and feel inspired through multiple touch points. And then remember that stat from earlier that donors fall off from lack of communication. The multiple touch points ac accomplishes that or points to that. Okay, number two, tell the right story to the right people. Segment your donors early on based on their relationship with your organization and understand their donor journey. Try to develop content to be as personalized as possible. For example, Natalie Newby is going to have a very different relationship with Girls Org than, say, a board member or a longtime volunteer like Simone. Be strategic with email timing, and messaging also matters here. Make sure everything you send is on message, it's on brand, and then again, when possible, tell stories. Uh, about real people who are impacted by the organization, not just with metrics. So this is the, the messaging point. Avoid donor fatigue. This is where um, Alexandria's comment plays into. Try to send emails that aren't just appeals. Don't be appealing, appealing, appealing all the time, asking donors to donate all the time, because that creates donor fatigue. You can always include a donate button in the end of every email, but make some of the emails about communicating your success, not just about raising money. For example, a milestone update without a donation ask. Remind donors of their impact. For example, your donation made this possible um, one month out from their initial donation. And then also, you can appreciate your donors through other strategies that are not um, not just communication, like perhaps a stakeholder appreciation event or digital campaign just to celebrate donors uh, throughout the year um, and also invite them to celebrate their impact too. Number four, be transparent. Be clear about your goals throughout the year and highlight milestones reached and accomplishments and even snags. Maybe your campaign ran into a road bump. It's okay to communicate that too. But by providing updates, it um, ensures that the donor knows that they want you to be invested in the success of whatever program you're running. And then finally, keep them updated. Keep them updated through um, updates on programming, but also you can provide a sneak preview into what your year-end fundraising plans are or plans for the next year. Or um, a lot of nonprofits like to create annual reports. Consider making your annual report um, a digitally accessible and easily shareable within donors. All right, I'm going to kick it over to Andrea again. Great. So now that we've gone over all of those ways to keep, Natalie, to keep donors engaged, let's see how we can apply them to our donor persona, Natalie the Newbie. 
First, we're going to not neglect her. We're going to thank her in time within 24 hours and immediately follow up on her donation. We're also going to be transparent with her in the thank you process and let her know that we're going to plan to follow up throughout the year to keep her updated on progress. We're going to tell her the right stories. Since she's a new donor, we're going to send a welcome email describing our com nonprofit's community, welcoming her to that community, and we're going to provide some background information on what our nonprofit has done and what we're planning to do. We're going to avoid donor fatigue by reminding, what the, by reminding Natalie of the impact of her donation and what the peer-to-peer -peer campaign that she donated to will accomplish. We're going to continue celebrating that first donation and participation by inviting her to uh, possibly a donor event or some type of other engagement. We're going to continue to be transparent with Natalie throughout the year. We're going to communicate relevant accomplishments that uh, she might be interested in hearing about and that our nonprofit is sharing out. And then we're going to keep her updated. We're going to let her know what our plans are for her for end of year giving. So perhaps because she gave for the first time as part of a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser started by one of her friends, what we'll do at end of year is engage Natalie by empowering her to her by empowering her to become herself a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising fundraiser organizer. And then how are we going to re-engage at the end of the year, those donors that we're able to cultivate through spring fundraising. So, you know, donor maintenance can be hard and time consuming, but it makes a huge difference. And when done right, it keeps donors coming back to support you year after year. Potential for more support in the future is huge, and it's easier to keep existing donors engaged rather than having to invest year after year in finding new donors. So how do you go about bridging the gap between spring and year-end fundraising? First, communication and your messaging and your story. Digital communication needs to be new and updated. You don't want to recycle your spring and summer communication. You should always be forward thinking to what you're going to be doing during the summer and fall. Small changes to your communication and the, about the work that your organization has done is essential throughout the year and as you br bring your donors into end of year. Make sure to include imagery. You don't want to be sending long-winded, long emails where, that your donor is going to have a hard time spending or having your donor is going to have to have spent a long time reading. Include a lot of imagery and use those images to tell the story. If your organization doesn't have good images, you can use a lot of free websites online and other resources to uh, for high quality photos. You're going to want to recap accomplishments. Keep updating followers on progress towards your fundraising goal and the closer that you get to reaching that goal. Having a clear and explicit fundraising goal and being transparent about your progress to that goal might increase a donor's donation even $5 so that they're inching you towards reaching that goal. And as you guys know, all of those $5 add up and make a difference. Preview next year, you're going to want to illustrate accomplishments from the current year, tell stories about the current year, and how you're going to parlay those accomplishments and what you're planning to do in the following year. And in doing this, you're going to want to focus on individuals impacted by your organization rather than metrics. And remember, less is more. Uh, make a lot of call to actions, make them loud and clear. Include a call to action several times throughout your email so that it's very clear to your donor that that is what you want them to be doing. Don't overwhelm with communication, but as you get closer to year end, ramp it up. So, you know, it is the end of November, you're going into December, it is okay to be emailing your donors once a week. It's not that you're being pushy, you're not being aggressive. View it as that you are advocating for your organization. You are the number one advocate. And then peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. For those that raise money during a spring campaign, give them the opportunity to continue fundraising for you in the fall and winter. Maybe they didn't reach their spring fundraising goal, so you're going to have them sign up for another opportunity to raise money. Market it as a new opportunity and just re-engaging them and supporting the organization. 
Remember that with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, you're going to want to provide a how-to guide with sample social media posts so that you are making it as easy and simple as possible for your peer-to-peer -to -peer fundraisers to fundraise on your behalf. Great, so how are we going to re-engage our donor persona, Natalie, for end-of-year giving? So between Thanksgiving, Giving Tuesday, and then end-of-year festivities, there are lots of ways that you can engage Natalie. The, the end of year giving might be a little bit more or less event focused, but you can definitely still hold something related to the holiday, or maybe you do a Giving Tuesday happy hour. You're able to utilize events still at the end of year. Segment out donors who gave earlier in the year, and also segment donors so you don't ostracize those who have given generously in the past. Thank them all and tell them all about their, how their contribution specifically helped your organization achieve what you wanted to do. Then pivot to appeal and ask them how they can give a bit more and get a little bit more involved than last time and be clear on how that is going to help your organization. Okay, so pulling it all together. Um, hopefully this was helpful for developing a roadmap for leveraging your existing donor network to bring in new donors through peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, you have strategies through uh, an, e uh, an email and communications plan to nurture those relationships and retain them throughout the year. And then also a game plan to re-engage those new supporters at the end of the year and figure out how their spring fundraising donor journey plays into the end of year. Of course, we used a persona in an example, and there are multiple different configurations and strategies depending on your organization's bandwidth and size, but here are just some examples you can use for your spring fundraising push. And then finally, we just want to give everyone a reminder that Give Lively is here to help. Um, we, of course, have our full suite of fundraising products that nonprofits can access for free, but we also have blog resources, how-to videos, FAQs, and other helpful resources that can support you in spring fundraising and beyond. In addition to that, we have a dedicated team of nonprofit advocates like Andrea that help hundreds of nonprofits on a daily basis um, learn how to utilize innovative technology to achieve their missions and how it best fits into their fundraising plans. All right, so uh, now I think we're going to open it up for questions. I'll kick it over to you, Seema. All right. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Andrea. So if you guys have questions, um, feel free to use the chat box. Uh, that you see in ReadyTalk, and I will ask them to Molly and Andrea. So we have um, a couple that have come in already. So uh, we have one question, do donors get uh, burnt out when charities are constantly asking for donations? Is there a way to avoid donor burnout? That's a great question. I think donor burnout is absolutely something that every development team at every nonprofit struggles with. I think the thing that you need to do to prevent donor burnout is to make sure that you are customizing the appeal for the specific donor, making sure that you're keeping in mind uh, why they got involved with your organization, and targeting your ask in a very strategic way. You want to have a plan you know, starting in January all the way through the end of year as to how you're going to approach the donor, keep them engaged, and um, you know, what your you know, strategic ask is going to be, whether it's at the end of the year, whether it's at the beginning of the fall. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with donor burnout, as we mentioned in the webinar, you don't want to have the only time you're talking to your donors be when you're making an ask. Make sure that they're feeling celebrated, that they're feeling in the loop, a part of your organization, that they know what's going on. Maybe even give them a little VIP treatment um, by previewing things that, you know, aren't going to necessarily be out on the, the website. Um, doing all of those things make them feel unique, special, and like a very high priority to your organization. And those are the types of things that are going to help them avoid burnout with your organization. And then when it comes to something like end of year, when they're getting hit by you know 100 different nonprofits for donations, they're going to remember yours, and your ask is going to stand out against everyone else's. 
All right, perfect. Um, so we got another question here. In terms of text to donate, um, how do you how how would one go about setting that up? Yeah, so Give Lively, we also we actually offer a text to donate program, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, it is free to use, so you would simply just go to givelively.org sign up to become a member. And then when you become a member, you get access to create text codes. Uh, those text codes are linked to campaigns that you build out. And so, you know, if you're having a gala and you have, you know, 500 people in a room and you want to use text to donate um, in real time to make an ask of your donors, you, you just create a text word. They're going to text that text word to a short code that we provide you. And uh, you're, that's, that's as easy as it, as it is. You're going to ask your donors, pull out your phone. They're going to pull out their phones, make the donation. Uh, we also have a live display feature, which allows you to see in real time donations coming in and you ticking more closer and closer to your goal. I will say that there are some other um, texting programs available out there. I would just say a simple Google search. Um, I have often heard feedback from a lot of our members that give lively that they are high cost. So that would be something just to consider. Great. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Carla. We are a new nonprofit starting in our third year. We help single moms move from poverty to prosperity with a career education. We want to do a Mother's Day event slash fundraiser. We did a Facebook ask last year. Didn't go too well. What would you recommend? First, Carla, wow, you guys are doing amazing work. And in your third year, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is keep pushing and pushing because you guys are going to get um, to continue growing and growing your fundraiser year after year. Um, I would say that Mother's Day is a really great opportunity to put an event together that will be celebrating these single moms. Um, so maybe engaging donors around doing like a flower drive. So donate $5. Um, send a flower to a, a single mom for Mother's Day to remind her that she's special. I know that, you know, Mother's Day is really important. I always want to make my mom feel special on Mother's Day. And so I think that that's a great opportunity to reinforce that. You could also do, uh, I don't know if you've done peer-to-peer -peer before, but I think Mother's Day is definitely something um, you can engage your stakeholders and current donors around. Everyone has a mom who doesn't love to celebrate their mom. So, you know, launch a strategic peer-to-peer -peer campaign, have your current donors reach out to their networks to support moms on Mother's Day. And I think that's a really strong and easy ask. Um, and yeah, it's a great way to get people engaged. And then you'll also be doing, you'll effectively be growing your donor base because, you know, even if you have five donors currently and they reach out to their greater networks, by the end of the campaign, you can increase those five current donors to 50. Okay. Uh, we have a really good question here from Jeff. Uh, does it help to have a multi-tier approach to an event by sending snail mail and following up with the various social media platforms, or is that overkill? It is definitely not overkill. You are throwing an event. You are planning an event. It is hard work, and you are putting it in. You want people to get there, and so drive them any way, drive them there any way that you can, um, especially thinking about different audiences. So, um, you know, you definitely have donors probably that skew older who are going to be checking their mailboxes every day. They expect to see that save the date in hard copy. They expect to see that invite in hard copy. But then you also might have like junior board members or millennial donors who, you know, they check the mail once every six months because everything is automated online for them. Um, and so, you know, they're going to be seeing things on social media. They're going to be getting things in their email, and that's how you're going to reach them. That being said, what is the harm in just bombarding people with social media and email? You want them to be reminded to be at your event. And then you also want to make it really easy for them to share with larger networks that they're going to your event, that your event is happening. So having it on social media makes it easy to share on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then you know emails can just be forwarded to huge groups of people. So I definitely think Multi-tiered approach is the way to go, and over-communication about, about events is always a good way. As people sign up for your event, though, make sure you segment them out of your list so they're not getting asked to RSVP when they've already done so. Great. 
Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, customizing campaigns and, um, you know, just making it more specific to the person, are there certain like data points that nonprofits should be thinking about um, to make sure that they're able to message their campaigns correctly? Yeah, I think there's a few things that you can do uh, with messaging. I think you should be definitely segmenting out um, you know, existing donors and even like how long those donors have existed. So if this is someone who's been by you for day one, um, you might want to send them a version of your campaign that's customized um, for people that ha already know a lot of information about your organization. They don't need to read your mission statement again because they eat, sleep, and breathe it. Um, and you also might want to send them a campaign page with suggested donation amounts that skew slightly higher. Whereas um, if you have some new, first, new donors who just gave for the first time and this is the next campaign, the next time that you're making an ask, I would definitely still be sending them material that you know, is directly uh, easily relatable to your mission, easily expressive of your mission. And then you might you know, want to tailor those customized donation, suggested donation amounts, excuse me, to be aligned with like a slight increase from what they've given previously, but not you know asking them to go from a five dollar donation to a five hundred dollar donation. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we have a, another question here, which is I guess I'm sure I'm sure you guys get this question quite a bit, but um, Katie is asking. We she said we struggled on Giving Tuesday last year. We think our donors may have been overwhelmed with lots of asks from different people. How can we stand out with our end of year campaigns? Yeah, I think that that's something that we heard a lot from our um, here at Give Lively from our membership base, especially members who are smaller organizations. Um, I definitely think Giving Tuesday, you know, it's widely successful for nonprofits across the country, but there are often times it is oftentimes overshadowed by some of those larger nonprofits who have really utilized it to capitalize on donations. That being said, like I always make the recommendation for our members to start their own giving day. Uh, you know, you're going to engage your donor base around your giving day, um, whether it's you know December 2nd because that's your executive director's birthday, or it's in the month of October because that's the awareness month for your cause. Uh, the thing about having your own giving day is that when your donors are sharing out their participation in your giving day, there's not going to be any other giving day going on. It's not this national push where people are just seeing it everywhere on Facebook, on Instagram, um, getting emails into their inboxes. So I would definitely say that you could start your own giving day. On Giving Tuesday itself, I would be strategic um, in your plan with your donors so that you have a very uh, mapped out communication plan throughout the day of Giving Tuesday um, that's going to reinforce your rallying call of action. And then with end of year, um, t I just think telling a story is always so important and that's what's going to make your organization stand out. The work that you're doing with the people that you're doing it for, tell the best story and give the best and most inspiring reasons for donors new and uh, recurring to re-engage with you at end of year. Okay. Um, all right. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So. Um, we have a question from Rita. So she said, our contributor board goes by amounts. White is up to $50, red is $50 to $250, and blue is $250 and above. We would like to have our donors over $500 sponsor an entertainment which averages of $2,000 and above. Um, do you have any advice on how to market for bigger donations for entertainment specifically? Yeah, Rita. So I don't know exactly, um, you know, I, I see that you have the different giving levels for your donors. I don't know if you've tried peer to peer, but again, I think that's a really effective way. So, you know, these white donors are $50, red donors are $50 to $250. If you ask everyone within that, those two groups, and even the blue donors, if you ask all of them to start a 
peer-to-peer -peer campaign and maybe even make it competitive, like white group versus red group versus blue group, who can fundraise the most for this entertainment that we're trying to provide. And then, you know, they're all starting their peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, they're pushing them out. Um, that's a really great way for them, you know, they might those donors might not be able to write a $500 check themselves, but they can garner donations throughout their network that's going to add up and you can use that um, as leverage for your, uh, your donation, or excuse me, your entertainment. Perfect, all right, and then our last question. Um, on your platform, what is the way that potential donors are shown that uh, a nonprofit is legal? Great question. Well, on our platform, it's really, um, you know, Give Lively. We do a vetting process for our organizations. So we utilize GuideStar, um, and we ensure that all of our nonprofit partners are in good standing with their 501c3. Um, and so I would say that that is how our platform does it. Um, if you are an organization and you want to ensure that donors are able to access that information on your behalf, I would definitely say ensure that your organization is listed on GuideStar, make sure that your um, 501c3 compliance is posted somewhere on your website. Um, and you know, I think that those are kind of the that 501c3 compliance and guidance are kind of the go-to within the donor community to make sure and check that an organization is a certified 501c3 nonprofit. Perfect. All right. So I think uh, that is it for our Q&A today. Um, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Molly, for your presentation. Uh, before we close out today, I would just love it if you guys could chat one thing that you guys learned in today's webinar. It's always fun for our presenters to see that real time. And then also we have a post-event survey. So if you have any feedback for us or con general comments or um, things that you would, webinars that you would like to see in the future, definitely let us know. Um, I look at all of those and any feedback that you have really helps uh, dictate future content. So if you could take a couple minutes to um, share that with us, that would be great. And then we are also on social media, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we also have a blog, blog.techsoup.org, where we post a lot of how-tos and tips and tricks and, and things like that. So um, feel free to check out our blog. We have uh, several more webinars coming up uh, for the end of February and then also um, beginning to mid-March that you see here. Uh, next week we have a webinar on how to drive social media engagement with nonprofit storytelling. Um, and you can see the others that are listed here. So if you get a chance, please join us for those. And again, I'd like to thank Molly and Andrea for today's presentation. Uh, thank you uh, to the audience for spending this hour with us. And thank you to our sponsor, ReadyTalk.